Hello and welcome back. We are uh, we are doing a new series here. So, uh, again, not really a set name because I was thinking uh, con uh, context construct, but building context. But you know what? I feel like I've got to uh, maybe diversify my naming structure here a little bit. But yeah, this is a special surprise uh, <laughs> surprise series for you. This is going to be a series where I go through, uh, I, I'll go through historic speeches. I will deliver the speeches to you. And then after going through the whole speech, I will go back and we can analyze the speech together. I, I look forward to your feedback from this. Uh, and I want to start with my favorite speech from American history, which is the Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech by Patrick Henry. This is one of the many speeches that preceded our going to war with the British for our independence, and it is a it is very much an important speech to American history, and I feel like there are a lot of very... Uh, th there are some very important lines in this speech that Americans don't really talk about. Most Americans just talk about the give me liberty, give me death. But there is a lot to this speech, a ton more than that. And, well, <laughs> I hope you guys end up liking it. Uh, remember to like and subscribe if you're on YouTube or BitChute. And, yeah. So, let's just jump into it. <laughs> No man thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism as well as abilities of the very worthy gentlemen who have just addressed the house. But different men often see the same subject in different lights, and therefore I hope it will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if, entertaining as I do opinions of a character very opposite to theirs, I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the House is one of awful moment to this country. For our own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery, and in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility with which we hold to God and our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time through fear of giving offense? I should consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country in an act of disloyalty disloy towards the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly kings. Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against the painful truth and listen to the song that the sirens the song of the, of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of the numbers of those who, having eyes, see not, and having ears, hear not, the things which so nearly concern the, their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost— I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging the future but by the past, and judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last ten years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the house. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. It will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourself to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourself how this great gracious reception of our petition comports with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? 
Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sir, by what, what means this martial array, if its purpose be not to force us to submission? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain and any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no others. They are sent over to, bl to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose to them? Shall we try argument? Sir, have we, we have been trying that for the last ten years. Shall we try? Have we, have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, but it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble, humble supplication? What terms shall we find that we have not already exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and implored an interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been cited, our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult, our supplications have been disregarded, and we have been spurned with contempt and the foot of the throne from the foot of the throne. In vain, after these things, may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to, pres to preserve inviolate these inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir. We must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left to us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week or, ne or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard is, shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effective resistance by, by lying supinely? on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot. Sir, we are not weak. We, we are not weak if we make proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. The millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a contrary way as, as which we possess are invincible by any forth, force which our enemies can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to, to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to 
to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is, ha the war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our e ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know no, I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. A very dramatic re reading. <laughs> um, though... It seems very fitting, uh, considering the context of this speech. This is a speech that Patrick Henry delivered in preparation for war to, to inspire our house, to inspire our people to make the commitment to go to war with, Bra with Great Britain during a time when Britain was still great. <laughs> Hashtag make Britain great again. <laughs> okay. A bit of a joke, but let, let, let's really look at this, though. This is a retort to people who are essentially arguing that we must have peace, that we should not go to war. And you can see plainly that Patrick Henry starts this speech by saying, oh, we're all patriots here, and I am very glad to be here with my fellow patriots. Uh, and just so you know, we do see things differently, and I mean no disrespect, and I hope you will allow me to speak uh, openly myself. That seems to be what this whole opening is. This, the, his introduction and first paragraph are specifically designed around <laughs> essentially making the case for freedom of speech, uh, for the freedom to deliberate on these arguments and to hear both sides not just of wishing peace but the side of wishing to um wishing to go to war because there is no peace uh, they make appeals to god uh he makes appeals to god continuously god in our country uh, heaven majesty of heaven uh, there there's a lot of this i am there's a lot of this to make the point that Patrick Henry is speaking in good faith. And he even brings up, for my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. Going to war with the British was more than just our, was more than just the U.S. fighting for independence, but we would have been fully subjugated to the whims of Great Britain. Had we not done it. And at that point, we may as well have been slaves. Our pleas were not being heard. We were trying to talk with their parliament. And they would essentially write us off. That is that is the setup for this this entire speech. And I think it's, it's really incredible what Patrick Henry manages to do in just speaking to people. Uh... He is known to not have written notes for his speeches. He simply gets up and speaks, or well, he did get up and speak. Uh, whenever he had something to say, he would just say it. Uh, he was a, one of the great orators of his time. So seeing this, I, I am almost certain that this was highly impassioned. I feel, I feel like that's a pretty safe bet, just considering he orates everything. He doesn't write it down. He just delivers a speech um and you you can you can almost feel the passion in the language he's using uh how often he uses the word sir uh down here to regard to the president he, he is continuously uh said he is continuously making a point that he is speaking to the to everyone but to the president and saying don't let anything convince you otherwise. So you can really feel that he is making such a strong argument for what it takes to get the freedom that the U.S. so wants and so signed with 
the Declaration of Independence. So he does dismantle the illusion of hope, uh, which is basically saying, hey, we can have peace with this. There are times when war is inevitable. There are times when hope is basically just a dream. And I think Patrick Henry does a really good job of saying that we – that there is a point where we cannot ignore the fact that war must happen. It's a painful truth, but if we just if we just go along with singing peace and trying to ignore the danger before us, it'll destroy us. It, it'll transform us into beasts. Wise, wise people, wise men must uh, endure a great and arduous struggle for liberty. You can't just – liberty isn't just given to you. It's always a struggle to be free and to maintain that freedom. There, There is a continuous struggle in that. Uh, you look at – he says, having eyes see not, having ears hear not. They, uh, just um, if you've ever seen the monkeys, hear no evil, speak no evil, or hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil, cover – uh, ears, eyes, mouth, um, and yeah, and he's bit, that's basically saying we we they're already making movements towards war, and we're ignoring it, and uh, which again that's really dangerous. It, you, I mean, people can make an argument that that's kind of a place that we're in uh, in the modern days with all of the. Um, rioting going on. You could make an argue that that, that we are having a hear no e a see no evil, hear no evil situation, wherein uh, many parties are ignoring all these quantities of organized violence. So you 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 can see kind of where things are going with this, and you, you could relate it to some stuff in the modern day. It, it, it's not nearly as clear today as it is in this, though. Uh, a better example may be that. It, the military movements that China's making in the South China Sea, uh, they lazed one of our ships down there. Like, they, there's a lot of stuff that's like, hey, uh, they're doing a lot with their military. They're kind of pointing lasers at us. Uh, may maybe they're thinking of going to war. Maybe not. We should we should, we should probably be prepared for that. Kind of like one of those like, hey, if if there is something that is obviously done for an obvious purpose that cannot be done for any other purpose other than this if there's an obvious reason for something being done um then the obvious answer is likely the uh the real answer it's it's not uh hamlin's razor i believe where uh, the most likely is the most likely of situations is probably the one that it is um so so that's really so this is all guiding towards the aspects aspects of war, um, and of course, uh, Patrick Henry uh, talks about how hey, judging by the past, all of our efforts to make clear communication they're not going to happen. We we've tried for ten years. It's insane to think it would change now. Th there's nothing else that we can really do. Um, he goes through, completely dismantles that they're being totally unreceptive to us. There is nothing that has given us any evidence that, hey, hey, they're gonna, they're gonna come and talk to us about this. They, they, we have, we have no evidence for that position. Um, and he just decimates that here, but. Uh, let me see, because I, I, I want to get to some of the, my favorite quotes. So actually, let me go back up and so I, I, I think Patrick Henry makes a few really key, there are a few really key lines to, I think the American philosophy that Patrick Henry makes in this speech. Um, and I think, I, I, th I think this is one of them. Uh, in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. 
that I think is a almost a lost um, or a very uh, a, a, a very risky um, position in the U.S. these days. There is not much debate that people are having anymore, and th- this is central to freedom of speech. This is central to why we have it and sort of the ethos that needs to be taken up in order to make sure that we are really doing the right thing and getting done what rightfully needs to be done. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think this is one, I think this is a very, uh, a line that a lot of people should hear about. I think this is a line that all of our politicians should read about and learn about. And it, it's definitely an ethos that I think has been lost to time a bit. Um, though I, I, I don't think it's dead. I don't think it's dead. I think it's just lost a bit. Um, and if we come down here. Okay, my scroll wheel is being a bit, bit weird. Sorry about that. So. Yeah, let's see. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve inviolate these inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble structure in which we have been so long engaged, and we and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir. We must fight. I think... I think this line... I think I, I think these two lines... Um, are... Yeah, there we go. I, I, I think these two sentences right here um, really capture something that I, I, I feel like I don't see, I, I feel like I see this in the left in, in the American left a lot like that's why they go out protesting and rioting all the time um, but I don't see this so much in in modern conservatives uh, again this, this is part of why uh, if you've seen my um, my uh, Con- recent construct cast on traditional progressivism or progressive traditionalism i should say got it backwards um progressive traditionalism this is why i uh, this is kind of the lot li- a line that i feel like differentiates conservatism and uh progressivism and why i say that progressives are the ones who draw to action whereas conservatives aren't necessary are fairly status quo uh maintaining because it is hard to put in the effort to uh get the change you want generally it 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 takes a lot of extra effort and i see most people trying to conserve conserve for peace so i I suppose you could say that where is the line well yeah i suppose you could say that in modern times, uh, at least from my perspective, from the conservative wing, I always see gentlemen may cry peace, peace. Like that, that that's what I feel like I hear a lot from conservatives. Um, you give them a foot, they take an inch type of thing. Uh, whereas a lot of people want to see more of this. It, if you want to preserve uh, the conservative values, if you want to preserve what it means to be a classical liberal or a traditional American, you need to take more action. Um, so th- th- this is a differentiation that I make in how I use language uh, from possibly the more colloquial use of language. And I, I, it's I'm just throwing this out there for people to consider, like, if we wish to be free and preserve and to preserve in, inviolate these 
inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending. So if, if you want to preserve the, the privileges and the rights that you have been trying to protect for so long, always for this, you need to fight for it. You can't just passively protect it and guard. You need to be active in protecting it. So that, that, I, I, I see uh, a big difference between people who just want to conserve things and try to maintain a semblance of peace versus those who are willing to acknowledge that, hey, there needs to be a fight here. Uh, so uh, you could say that this actually kind of uh, this kind of goes well with my um, with my analysis that I had before about the uh, progressive traditionalists uh, just from that quote alone. But we look here and let's see. This is this pair. This entire paragraph is just. Uh, this is. A masterwork. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week or the next year? Like, you could feel the sarcasm almost. <laughs> and I, it definitely seems sarcastic to an extent. Um, and very effective at just being like, Oh yeah, so we're we're so weak now. So are we, are, are we going to be stronger when they disarm us? Are we going to be stronger when they have their guards in all of our houses? Are we going to be stronger when um, we've just been doing nothing? Like, if ever there was an effective call to arms, this is it. This is it. This is this is the logical argument for the call to arms, and and it's simultaneously. Uh, full of it's simultaneously full of um, a, a strong pathos argument which uh, if you guys know me I, I typically don't like pathos but I love it when it's combined with uh, solid logos so lo logic and emotion right there um, and, and there are arguments for morality too in here which is ethos so um, I th it's really this entire argument is just – it's incredibly strong, and it shows why it actually reflects part of why we have our constitution the way we do. So when will we be stronger? Will it be when we are totally disarmed? Second Amendment. When they're stationed in every house. That's the Fourth Amendment, I believe, uh, that we're protected from that. Uh, like, you can see the – underpinnings of what made our bill of rights a decade before our bill of rights was made in this speech that's one of the things that's so incredible of it and um this writing of the speech um this was made i think it said 40 years later or something like that um i i, I was reading an article related to this uh yeah right here but but uh, and this is through uh, emersonkent.com. I will post a link for it. But so you guys can look at it too, of course. But this is um, you you can really just see what kind of inspired the direction we ended up going through this speech, and I. I, I really want to point out a few other parts of this because there's even stuff in this, this that, of course, fights against. Ow, bit my tongue. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that argues against the um, argues against slavery. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. First off. The imagery of slavery is really strong, but it, it's interesting that a nation that was being born with slavery would you would defend th themselves and their freedoms with remarks as to slavery. So you you can you can see right away that 
the the founders, at least some of them, at least Patrick Henry, uh, and, along with some others, were wanting to end slavery. And, and I think that's why they were using this language. They probably were hoping that with the use of this language, they would uh, the um, the the nations and the uh, colonies that were relying on the states and colonies that were relying on slavery would be willing to sort of be like, yeah, we don't want slavery for ourselves. Maybe we shouldn't have it for our people. It didn't work, but th this definitely set the foundation of what was to come with that. Um, definitely incredibly powerful imagery. It, it's it's really great. And again, he, he uses the uh, God who presides over the destinies of nations. He, he's He's using all of that ethos. He, he's using every type of uh, argument for, towards getting people to really support him. It, 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 this speech is a masterwork for inspiring people to change and inspiring the people. Um, so one of my favorite lines, and I... The, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to get too much into the give me liberty or give me, give me death because I think that that sentiment really is the uh, – it really summarizes this entire argument so well. So I, I, I'm not going to belittle that, but I think one of the most powerful lines in this – I think the most powerful line in this, in this entire speech is, is life so dear or peace so sweet? as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. This line, this line right here, speaks to me so much, especially since the lockdowns have happened from COVID. Is life so dear, peace so sweet, as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? At this moment in time, the U.S. largely, our government, has forbade us from working. It has forbade people from going out and commencing their commerce, acting as they see as they see fit to act, conducting their business as they see fit to conduct, and living the life that they have built for themselves. And what does the government say? It's for our safety. It's for our peace. Life is too dear. One life lost is too much. But freedom lost, freedoms lost, liberty lost, is harder gained. Liberty lost, in some cases it can't be regained. And what do we get for trading our liberty for life? Chains that bound the way we live. This. Right here. To me, this is the sentiment of what it means to live with the American spirit. Manifest destiny and all that. Every, everything that is the liberty that Americans idolize. To me. This line is a sentiment that speaks endlessly to it. So, ask yourselves, for you, personally, on a personal level, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? What would you sacrifice? What, what would you be willing to put up with for the sacrifice of your liberties? Well, that is it for this one. I am ending it here. Uh, it has been a pleasure to speak with you all. And again, if you're visiting on us on YouTube, please like and subscribe if, you, if you're visiting us on Bet you like subscribe again comment down below wherever you are if you're on uh if you are on locals again please like comment share uh our community is based around your action and what you do 
and every bit of support you give me, every bit of support you give our community is another breath of life for us, and it keeps this coming, it makes us strong, and it lets me keep putting out content like this and more, and yeah, I... I'm very happy to deliver this to you. I'm sure plenty of you may not have ever heard this speech or uh, maybe you haven't read it since elementary school, U.S. history. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know a lot of schools don't go into too much detail with this stuff and maybe you never thought to look it up, but I wanted to go back and bring this to you and I have many more to come. So... I hope you look forward to it. It has been a pleasure being here with you. And this is James Darian signing out. I will see you guys later. It's been a pleasure.